This is the Big Woods Bucks Podcast. Come explore the big woods and timber in North America with your host, Maine Master Guide and Deer Tracking Expert Hal Blood. Listen to Hal and co-hosts Lee Libby and Joe Cruzy as they unlock the secrets of Big Woods Whitetails. Each episode will provide valuable insights in the tried and true system Hal has used for the last 40 years to scout, locate, and hunt mature Big Woods bucks. Listen and laugh as the crew discusses Hal's legendary adventures and learn how to apply a lifetime's worth of lessons from the Big Woods to your own hunting and outdoor adventures. Welcome to the Big Woods Bucks podcast. I'm Hal Blood, the host, sitting here with my two co-hosts, Lee Libby and Joe Cruzy. We also got a special guest this morning, Kev Harrison from Meredith, New Hampshire. And uh, Big Woods Bucks team member, we're kind of doing a series on the different team members so everybody can get to know them. So we brought Kev in and uh, going to talk about deer hunting and whatever else he wants to talk about his life. Probably involve a few women or something, but that's all right. <laughs> Welcome, Kev. Well, it's good to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh-huh. So, uh, Kev didn't know. Kev just met Joe this morning, but because uh, he kind of skipped town to Jackman a while back, and he hasn't been around much. But him and Lee go way back. They had some good times together and various things from deer hunting to logging, huh, Kev? Yeah, character building, I think. We <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. It just proves that everything in life happens because of necessity. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Whether you want it or not, Absol- that's the next step. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh. Absolutely. So, Kev, uh, how'd you end up in Jackman anyway? Well, I've been coming up here with some friends and such, and then uh, I came up for a winter because I didn't have a license. <laughs> and, um, you, mean, you mean a hunting license, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't the issue. Yeah. Uh, so, came up, stayed, uh, got a job in town, bartending, and uh, just planned on spending the winter, actually, and then uh, took your guide school in the spring, that first spring, just, just yeah. to take it, because I didn't know you could take guide school, and <laughs> <laughs> right in Jackman, Maine. Yeah, so what year was that, anyway? I forget now. I don't know, maybe like 2001 or two. Yeah, geez, that long ago? Yeah, Ooh. right? Yeah. We're getting old. Nope, you're getting old. <laughs> I think you talk about that every episode, Hal. Yeah. Well, everybody calls me the old man, so yeah. uh, kind of got to be known you know. for something. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. So you took. I remember when you took the guide school. You come signed up for guide school. I'd seen you down the down to the uh, Moose, Moose Point, Point there bartending. We'd eat there once in a while, and you took the guide school. And I yeah. remember you had to convince me to take. Pay, I don't know. I think you had to pay like was it 100 bucks extra to take the test or something like that? Uh, or I was yeah. paying it and I wasn't going to take the test. I was just like, I just want to take the, I just want to take the class. And you can. Oh me yeah, take yeah. The, That's right. Take you, the test. I was like, yeah, I said, geez, you're going to take the class, Kev. Get your guides license, you know. So uh, you did. Passed it first time, didn't you? Yeah, I did. Yeah. 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 I, I'm sitting here trying to figure out where I'd seen you before, and you just you were a bartender at Moose Point. That's right. So yeah, I was coming up in it. those years yeah. hunting, and I remember seeing yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. The women used to throw tip money at him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's why he didn't. That's they why they still do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just driving down the street, women are throwing <laughs> money. At him. Yeah, that's oh, how we got home a few nights. <laughs> <laughs> that's a cookie or two. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought of another story. <laughs> well, this is gonna oh. be a good one. So yeah, I remember when you when you took the uh, when you took the guide school, I I could see something in here. I said, "Geez, I, that's one of them guys." I was always picking, you know. I could see recognize talent in my guide school. That's how I ended up with a lot of guides like Lee and a couple of the other ones, Tommy. But anyways, uh, so I think it was after that you got your license right off, and then I asked you if you wanted to do some guiding. Right, that same fall was it? Yeah, you had uh, I think you had Zach that. Uh was waiting on he didn't wind up getting it so then that kind of opened up a position for me to start bear hunting or bear guiding and then yeah, uh, i think i did right. a couple couple three weeks i think that first year and then it just evolved from there yeah lugged bait and then i took you moose hunting that year yep first time i went up yep. uh that was zone five with five Corey. yeah five yeah showed you a little uh moose action right yeah yeah, one thing that was crazy is that I'll never forget. We were sitting there. It was like Wednesday. I hadn't shot a moose yet. And then all of a sudden, 
howls like in the literally in the ditch, sick as a dog, like hood up, like fetal position, get back to camp, and that was with the uh, flatliner that hunt. Yeah, and um, so they're kind of ribbing me about. Oh, I can't wait to hear you call in the morning. I wonder what that's gonna be like. <laughs> you know, I'm like, mm, yeah, me too. You know, <laughs> and then uh. Figure, all right, I'm just thinking about where we're going to hunt and everything the next morning. And then I wake up in the morning. Literally took, I actually took some blankets that I had, put them over Hal when we were in camp there in the tent. And all of a sudden I wake up in the morning and it was like Jesus standing there. I'm like, is that Hal or is he, you know, like a, just some form or something, you know, because I can't believe he's standing there. And he's like, yep, all set. Must have broken the night. <laughs> all right. <laughs> I, oh. I've heard Hal called a lot of things, but Jesus didn't. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it was just funny, you know. Does he yeah, have his, uh, yeah. his tidy whities on? Uh, oh, yeah. 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 All in yeah. His, his glory right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So just to back up a little bit, because um, you skipped over, like you guys all knew what you were talking about. Who was Flatliner? The hunter. This guy yeah, have heart conditions? The, no, just kind of no emotion, you know. Oh, okay. First morning. The first morning we saw that big bull, right? Yeah. Like 50 for sure, a beautiful bull. I could see one horn, then I could see the other. And when I did, I'm like, yeah, that's 50 inches for sure. You know, it's like 30 yards first morning. He goes, is there bigger ones than that around? And I go, yeah, I'm sure there is. He goes, oh, I'll let that one go. And we had a long week. He finally shot one on, uh, we probably saw at least, everything we saw after that was like all in the 40s, 45, 46, 40, 43. Yeah, everything is in the 40s, but nice one, nice looking ones. Friday, he finally decided to shoot one of them. Took a while to call that one out, but I got him out just before dark, what, 20 feet from you guys, Kev? Yeah, like popped out like right onto the road, crossed the ditch, and like he's standing in front of me, and then his brother standing over the side, and it was just literally like right in the, we were on one ditch, and that thing was in the middle of the road, and then it starts walking, walking, and I said, if you're going to shoot it, you better shoot it now. And pow, 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 pow. And uh, they wound up getting it. And that was like Friday night. Yeah. We got it. Yeah, they got their money's worth their week of hunting. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. 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 They got the whole thing. Then I guided them deer hunting. Yeah. A little while later. Yeah. And yeah, so, anyways, one thing I wanted to ask you about, we've been asking the other guys too, is, is uh, your favorite uh, deer rifle. I know you veer off from a bunch of the guys that hunt in the big woods, so let's tell us tell us like what you like to hunt with, Kev. Well, since I started hunting in the big woods, I use a forty four lever action. It's a Winchester ninety four model. Uh, yeah. AE. So putt, putt gun. I call it the putt gun. Yeah. Pep, 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 pep when he shoots. <laughs> Good thing it's got ten holes, ten rounds. He <laughs> <laughs> seems to use about all of them every time. Is that yeah. legal? <laughs> That's an interesting choice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know what? It's really I always wanted one, and I think it's pretty. And yep. that's why I like <laughs> hey, whatever using works it. for you. <laughs> you know, and, but it is a good gun. I mean, it, it's like carrying a stick in the woods, really. So, and I just, it's just so easy to travel with, you know, when when I'm travel through the woods. So I just, I like it. It's kind of like, um, you know, what do they say? Live by the sword, die by the sword. It's one mm-hmm. of them things. I know it's got limitations, but. Yeah, you use it. It's my gun. I like it. You know, yeah. I've, I've killed bear with it, killed an elk with it, you know, deer. So you use it so, for everything. Yeah, I killed my moose with it last year. Really? Yeah. So it's one of them. Yeah, and I you just s- like it. You, just, you got buckhorn sights, original buckhorn sights, don't you? Yeah, yeah, because I don't think, I don't like <laughs> That's the, impressive, actually. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's it's pretty cool. I don't like the peep sights. It's not, I, it, I like the way it looks. I, want a, I love peep sights, but I just put one like... I just don't think it looks good on it. Have so. you have you lost many animals with it that you think you would have got with a different rifle or ones that are just a little bit out of range or you know probably the longest two shots I've ever made on deer were with that gun. One was 110 paces. It was definitely 100 to easy 110 yards. Um because I grew up hunting with a shotgun in southern New Hampshire, so it was never I just didn't have the opportunity. There was no cuts or anything like that. So and I'm not saying I wasn't lucky, I'll tell you that, but so, so mm. far, but I know, yeah, if there's one running 200 yards across the cut, I'm probably going to unload on it, but I probably won't. <laughs> I probably won't hit Elevate. It. What, do you, Elevate. what do you shoot for ammo out of that? Do you shoot that lever evolution stuff or? You know what? I never have. 
Uh, I used to shoot either was it 180 or 240 grain, uh, just whatever Remington, you know, lead and brass. And uh, I just bought a box of those Lever Revolutions and tried it out like two weekends ago, and I definitely saw a difference really? in how they yeah. flew. So now it's just. How do they do when you put it in an animal, you know? Yeah, or through animal. the woods. You think they'll be all right in the brush? I think so. Yeah. I think we're going to. Remember gonna... that big 10 I lost up to the the border Gold, there yeah. with the stupid muzzle loader and the sticks? Oh. <laughs> I know. That's another story later. But... Yeah. Where, think, where did you uh, moose hunt last year? Uh, New Hampshire. I finally got drawn in New Hampshire. Oh, after. wow. That's a... Yeah, 30 years. They had 51 permits, and I finally, I finally got one. I was one of 51. Yeah, yeah, I was in shock. Yeah. So right in zone F, which was nice because that's right above where I live. Yep. So it was easy to scout, and I had it was nice because I had people that helped me out and so some land access and stuff like that because it's a lot of national forest. How many days did you hunt? I hunted uh, actually seven days. Yeah, we saw uh, ten bulls, and there was just some. I was just kind of holding out and. Come Friday afternoon, muzzleloader season was starting the next day, so I didn't know what that was going to do to the woods. You know, it was influx of people coming in, and I really had a great hunt. I mean, I was like, hunted all week, didn't, you know, do emails, didn't do anything like that. I just enjoyed it, and I said to my brother, I said, whatever is next moose we see, whether it's a cow or a bull, I'm going to shoot Oh, it. it's any moose permit. It was either sex, yep. yep. So I wound up. I mean, 20 minutes after that, <laughs> <laughs> here come this <laughs> small bull, and... Let it yep. have it. So did you did up. you pass on any decent ones? Did you see any good bulls out of those ten? I'm just interested in the moose herd over there. And yeah, I mean, they were, I just saw I saw a bigger one scouting. It was yep. just the way it was. I mean, I could have ended it. I mean, half hour into it, about yep. on Saturday morning, we saw two bulls, but it was just they weren't the ones I saw. And I was just there are some big ones, you know. There's some good moose, yeah, like anywhere in a sense. But no, it's good. What are the dates of that hunt? In New Hampshire? Late October. It's like the... Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah last, after the rut. Yeah. Last week. Yep. Hunting, so. them, hunting them like deer, huh? Kind of, yeah. Yeah. And But they were... We had ones coming to the call, you know, kind of like up here. When you, November sometimes, it's easier to call them in in November yeah. than it is when it is... It's like the second season in Maine. Yeah. And the big ones just lay down. They're yeah. done. On those tough years, it could be kind of depressing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Add a little heat to it and a fat client, <laughs> you're doomed. <Yeah. laughs> oh, oh. No. Lib, why you always pick on clients? Because I'm fat, so <laughs> I can say it. It's this is like bald people can pick on bald people. Fat <laughs> people can pick on fat people. <laughs> oh. Oh. So when can we start telling funny stories? Oh, anytime you want. Oh, all right. I think oh, you're going to have to start. You guys are better telling stories than I am. Yeah. No. So what was it? Let me think about this. When you started logging, you'd been up guiding quite a few years, right, Kev? So you guided you guided for me for, geez, I don't know. Five. Honey? Five, then I went to Montana, then I came back. Oh. Whoa, you went, what'd you that, do in Montana? Yeah, that's right. How'd you end up in Montana? <laughs> well, it wasn't work, so it must have been a woman, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, was she native of Montana? As, about as native as you can get. <laughs> yeah. I feel like I'm missing out on something. I feel like the kid that didn't go to high school with you guys, and you guys all went together and <laughs> got all these stories. Yeah. Lib's over here puking on himself, laughing. I'll never forget we were in Ontario, so Kev's plan was he went to – Montana, and then he'd come back, I think, and he was got to go back out to see this girl. He was going to Ontario deer hunting, and uh, he was going to hunt the week with us, you know, and then continue to Montana when we went home. And uh, I don't know who caught him, but if it was Lee, I think it was Shanzi, because me and Shanzi used to sleep in the living room downstairs, and the rest of the guys bunked upstairs in the two bedrooms. And Lee Shanzi must have opened one eye on the way down, and his comes Kev tiptoeing down the stairs, dragging his pack. And uh, Lee go, and it's like it's only like three days into the hunt. And he goes, "What are you doing, Kev?" He goes, "Ah," he said, "I gotta, I just gotta go." He said, "I gotta go to Montana." <laughs> <laughs> well, let's put it. Let's, let's say this also that there was like three feet of snow in the woods, and it was hard to cut a track. 
Oh, that is not a good excuse. <laughs> no, no. no, that doesn't work here. <laughs> you, and you're halfway there. Are, are you, <laughs> yeah, exactly. If you're trying to get some sympathy, that's not working. To, so we, track. the funny part of it was, was he was in such a hurry to get to Montana, but he was in more of a hurry to get back from Montana. <laughs> when he finally had enough of her, she was clinging on his windshield wiper blades on the hood of his truck when he was trying to leave. <laughs> didn't, you come, didn't you come back missing a mirror? The last thing she got out of you was a mirror off the Jeep. <laughs> How long did it take to get to that point? What, in Nine this, this is the Big Woods Bucks relationship special, Nine by months. the way. Yeah. <laughs> get from Ontario to Montana or from Montana to me. <laughs> Montana. Yeah. That's a four-day trip. Oh, yeah. Tony that was funny. I shot my mule deer on my own. It was like, all right. Time to yeah. Go. Yeah. <laughs> time, to, time to wrap it up, right, Joe? <laughs> yeah. What's your favorite saying? The cookies are gone. Let's wrap it up. Yeah, cookies are yeah. gone. Time to wrap it up. That's when we'd always kill. All, we'd get all the moose that morning. Kev would say, cookies are about gone. Let's, let's wrap it up. Yeah. <laughs> we killed three that day. So it's yeah. <laughs> hey. You like you were a good deer guide though. All your clients, when I guided with you, we used to talk at night, and we had some clients that were just absolute go getters, and some that you know fell short early in the season or early in the week. Yep. And uh, yep, I remember one night. So me and Kev had had, had not hunted together a lot. Uh, we guided together a lot, but not hunted together. So I had a client that gave up early on a. 12 inch snow day he got tired so he was back to camp by one and i pulled into the camp and kev was just getting out of his truck i said let's go kill something he says yeah yeah let's go so i know where there's this buck he says so we head out not too far from jackman eight or ten miles there and sure enough there's a buck track so kev says let's take it takes us through a swamp and he's parallel in this road so i looked at kev i said i'm gonna run up run down that road and you know eventually you got a bump and maybe you'll jump across so i run up to the road <clears throat> took a right and i kind of was parallel in where i thought kev was we couldn't have been 150 yards apart no and i come up to the top of this little crest and i said this is perfect i could see 200 yards one way 200 yards back my tracks i'm like this is perfect i'm sitting there i got my finger on the safety and i'm looking and i'm looking and i'm looking and all of a sudden, I see Kev standing in the road, and he shrugs his shoulders. And I'm like, why did he come off the deer track? What's he doing? So I walk back down there like, what's going on? Did you jump him or something? Kev's like, you didn't see that deer? I'm like, what deer? He goes, the ones that made these tracks crossing this road. <laughs> that son of a gun come right out behind me and walked behind, across that road while I was standing in it and didn't see him. So then it cuss you, I had a nutty. I'm like, nah, I'm going to kill that deer. I'm killing that deer. So we bail up over the bank, and we're almost on a dead run. And out of this thicket comes a set of antlers, and, and it's running through the woods. I pull up, click, like a professional, and Kevin's like, stop, stop, stop. And there's this little bull moose running, and all I could see was those horns, so I was going to lay that thing out. <laughs> <laughs> Kev screams, stop, stop, stop. Thank God I didn't pull the trigger, but that was the end of that. Kev didn't let me live that one down for a while. I, I just drove down the camp road last night looking for Al's house. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, this is old camp. Yeah. That was a good little spot there. Yeah. That was yeah. a good spot. What was one of your favorite hunts for clients? I mean, it was 10 years stint, weren't it? Pretty clear. Pretty yeah. near 10 years. Yeah, probably. At the, Cedar Ridge? Or? Yeah. Probably the first one that comes to mind as far as guiding, which was kind of a crazy, crazy day, was we were up, uh, up in the notch, and I had two hunters, John Lamb and Sean Murphy, and it was just one of those two-on-one, so one hunter will come with me, one hunter will give him a little area to hunt, give him some boundaries. So John and I were together, and we cut a nice track, deer goes up, we're on it, on it, on it, and it come back across... Uh, the notch road and then we go up and it's feeding feeding so like all right this is good so then it starts to go up top we get up to the top and again feeding and all of a sudden you can tell it took off and oh no let me go back i screwed this 
all up. I'm not good at telling stories. So when we got to where that was, <laughs> where that deer was feeding, all of a sudden we see Murph's track come, and he gets on our deer. Oh. So I'm like, all right, no big deal. We'll let Murph take that one. So then we're working, working, and then I see, we come on this big buck track, but it was old. But I said, Jesus, this is worth following anyway, and we'll see in it. It's kind of perfect because it just kind of scrolled us right up through in a nice, easy way to get up there. So we wind up on top, and we had called Murph on the radio and said, Hey, Murph, you're on our didn't he, you know, the deer we were on, he didn't, he kind of didn't know what we were talking about. So that other buck track, when we get up in there, it took us to where there was a lot of feeding going on. And I said, All right, here's that buck track. And now we got on it, it freshened up, and we, we start on that. And as we're coming down the hill, all of a sudden, it kind of did a side hill, and then all of a sudden there's Murph's track on that buck track that we were just on. So we're like, what? Intercepted. Again. Cut off <laughs> twice. So we're like, Murph, you're now you're on our buck track the second time. Well, he's like, what are you talking about? So what happened was that buck, the second buck we were on, came down, and actually Murph saw it. Oh, no. And then went over it, but the deer, <laughs> the way his track went and the other one inter- intercepted, it was like logs blown down and stuff. So we just assumed that was the deer he was on. So he wound up cutting our track twice and literally had no idea. We knew everything that was going on that day, and he had like no <laughs> idea what he was doing. We, had, we knew more about what he was doing than we did. <laughs> but we never wound up killing them. So he didn't kill either one of them? Nope, but he saw, no. saw the second one we were on. Yeah. So it was just kind of funny. So that's kind of the most memorable, in a sense, as with clients. Yeah. Well, you're still friends with them guys, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I am. That's what happens a lot of times. You just click with some hunters, and you just sometimes become lifelong friends. Yeah. That's the way it is. Yeah. That's a a good part about guiding. Some of the – because Kev's always full of good advice, because I'm a little quick to sometimes react. So I just got my guide's license, and – I you know, had what I thought was plenty of experience, but I didn't know how I was going to tell my clients that I was first year guide, you know, and and make them feel comfortable. And was sitting in camp one night, and I said, "Geez, I just hope nobody asks, you know, like how long you've been guiding, because what am I going to say? Oh, I got my guy's license this fall, and Hal hired me." <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Kev sitting in the chair very calmly with a Jack and Coke, and says, "Lib." You can tell them anything you want. Just don't lie to them. <laughs> I'm like, oh, all right. <laughs> yeah, it is tough because I like I had never gone bear hunting, moose hunting. Never. I followed a bunch of deer, but I never tracked a deer, and then never killed a 200 pounder when I started guiding. You so know the. I, I think the I best guides have the most common sense. You know what I mean? Because even yeah. though you were put in that situation where you never had done it before. You're so in tune with trying to make it a successful hunt for your client that that stuff just comes to you. I know it does, Hal, because he's just a natural, and I know Joe. It all comes to you. The stuff that you think of that, you know, it's just, it's all about the client. It's their hunt. It's their hunt, right. Mm -hmm. So no matter how you're feeling, sick or not sick or whatever, you got to make it. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a, I always tell people that guiding, is, killing is a very small part of guiding. It's probably the smallest part of guiding. I mean, people come back to a place because of the camaraderie, the lodging, the food, um, what they see, what they experience. I mean, a lot of things that I remember from guiding are, don't have anything to do with the deer. Right. You know? Yeah. And it's just, that's just the way it happens, you know? So it's, and it's a whole, you got to, you know, you got to manage the week because it's always about the right buck on the right day. And if you're not, you walk the legs off somebody monday and you finally come across that track thursday, thursday and they got yeah. nothing they're cooked. you're never gonna catch them right you no, just that's, catch that buck. hey that's libs them all that's what he does <laughs> <laughs> no, we just gotta get him to that reality point. <laughs> yeah. then we can mold them but yeah you know the other thing that we had uh to our advantage was we could come home at night even if a buck kind of stumped us in the day because we were new uh we could come home and sit around a table with eight or ten of the best deer hunters in the country, period, yeah. and say, Hal, today I had a buck do this. And I remember once I asked Hal, why did that buck do that? This one buck went nine miles from, oh, the blue camp on the mile, I want to say, not 15. Anyways, he went nine miles, headed right to town. 
and in seven or eight different spots he went to a bedding area where you could see a depression in the in the leaves there was snow on the ground where he wanted to lay down but n- not once he'd stammer around a little bit and then take right off i asked how why'd that buck do that well he had somewhere else to go lip yeah <laughs> and to me yeah. i'm like trying to overanalyze this back to the common sense <laughs> remark you made a minute ago yeah. and the old man's like yeah he had somewhere else to go so yeah. I mean, it was incredibly valuable because just the stories, I mean, you learn, you know, you learn from everyone else's stories, yeah. you know, whether it's even with bear hunting, that was a big thing. I mean, you always ask, so tell me exactly what happened, whether they killed it or they shot right. or whatever, you know, tell me exactly what happened. So you can put it in your, you know, in your back of your mind. So when you come across that situation, you're like, all right, you know, you can just, it's all knowledge, especially Right, you don't learn from when it goes right, you learn from when it goes wrong. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. and especially, I mean, I was always lucky with Hal because we'd go looking for moose antlers and stuff like that and just be able to hear all the stories, I mean. Yeah. I don't tell that many stories, do I? You just tell Mm. a few all over and over again. (laughs) (laughs) We were going up one time. I remember the first time I rode with Joe, we went up scouting for moose, remember Joe? When you get, I think it was the year you got your permit, wasn't it? Yeah. We headed up for zone. Yeah, we headed up to Zone One, so it's a you know five and a half hour drive. So Joe's driving, and I'm just riding Tell every him. road. He knew every. Ro- I'm not. This is not an exaggeration. Oh, I mean, oh, yeah. when you get up there, you know, North Main Woods is big for anyone that's been up there. It, it's big country, and there's it's easy to get turned around and and you know not know where you are. And Hal's telling me stories on. I mean, every five miles, it's a different story and. It takes a lot of years to spend that much time up there, yeah. let alone have a story at each, you know, in that many places. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, a lot of people would think that there's a lot of uh, embellishing and, you know, <laughs> it didn't, but it's it it's the real deal. Something. Yeah. <laughs> Finally, was, Joe, I remember Joe goes, hey, is there any place up here you ain't been? <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. want to talk about stories that would be hard to believe. Kevin Hal had a client in Ontario once, right? And the Ram Charger broke down. Tell us that story. Yeah, on it all day. (laughs) Well, he wasn't a client. He was a a friend of mine. We took up, started hunting with him, and then we become friends. But (laughs) Steve and we had, we went early, right? We we drove up. He flew in. He flew in. We drove in, and we got there. I think like three days before Steve was going to show up. So we were going to go do a little scouting, and we got there. We had good snow. And I want to tie this. This is going to be cool because we're going to tie it all into uh, our next um, film, short film for the club. But um, first, was it the first day, Kev, I shot that buck or the second day? I, I think can't. it was. No, yeah, it was the second day. Yeah. It was a cold day. Yeah, cold day. Yeah. So, uh, but anyways, we'll fast forward that to the, I think the story you're getting about was our walk out, Lee. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So anyways, we hunted that week and. Steve showed up, and it was cold. I mean, it, it was at least zero and probably below zero the whole time. And I shot a nice buck. Kev shot a nice buck. And in the last day, I was coming out with Steve, and we were walking out. We had radios, and Kev's got the Ram Charger all warmed up for us. And that was great. We're all excited. And Steve had to fly out like 630 the next morning. So we get out there and get in the Ram Charger, and I jumped in started driving, and I get about uh i don't know not even a half a mile huh yeah not very far at all and and the ram charger goes it just shuts off i mean i knew it was electric it shut off it didn't cough or sputter or do anything but just shut off i knew i'm like i turned around i looked at kev i go that didn't sound very good how many miles in it was we were we were at mile it was 24 24 kilometers kilometers. up there is in kilometers and it, we were 24 in and five more on a side road, 29 kilometers from Ta. Yep. Yeah. So <laughs> shut off. Yeah. And I'm thinking to myself, because the Ram Charger, you know, it's old and it's they're easy to work on them old vehicles. <laughs> and I always carry all the electronic parts spare right in my console. I got a ballast resistor. I got a voltage regulator. I got a I got a starter relay. I got everything there. And I changed a couple things and nothing. And I know Kev's Kev's just standing there like, I know he's shaking his head like. Finally, he goes, I'm going to walk out of here and see if we can catch a truck. Yeah, they are doing burning out there and working. Yeah, we knew out on the main road, it was a main it was a main logging road. And they'd been logging on it because, you know, we'd been in there. We see they were logging. So 
He goes, I'm going to go catch a truck, get out the end of the road and catch a truck, right? Yeah, I was hoping to, but it was like, it was, I don't know what time it was, but it was kind of past that window where you kind of right. catch someone leaving. There weren't anybody else coming out after they, huh. <laughs> after they left. Yeah, so yeah I remember. fire going. Finally, I said, I told Steve, I said, well, I got to walk out of here. Be, I said, you can stay and make, I'll make a fire or you can go and you're like, oh, I'm going to walk. So we all, we walked out and we get out to the corner and Kev's got a fire going. It's cold. He's waiting on us. He's got a fire going on the corner of the road there and hadn't been a truck by you there. No, 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 not at all. He'd I been there maybe an hour. Yeah, probably. Yeah, probably we come by an hour later. So now it's getting later. And we know no one's coming out now. Yeah. We keep thinking like, you know how you're like wishful thinking? Like, well, we got to walk because it's cold, but probably a truck will come along, right? There's got to be another truck coming out of this road because the road goes another from where we were. It's 24. Probably another pretty near 24 kilometers in beyond it, and it splits up. So we started walking, and we'd go by them every uh, kilometer we see. We'd tick that one off, 24, 23, 22, 21, right down the line. And we were move like you. We were walking, but that – and you just got the you know the lacrosse boots and just socks yeah. on you know yeah. and then you get that frozen road yeah frozen gravel road you know with just kind of like ice down yeah. a little bit with the hard snow and it's below zero yeah. your yeah. feet go numb why, why didn't you just pull you out your inreach and send a message back to camp you have those <laughs> <back then>. <laughs> yeah <laughs> and and the oh yeah that back that's a funny thing too was that particular area that we were hunting that day you could get a cell signal there because it was near the lake and it shot across the lake right to the little town up there where we stayed. And there was cell service, and not a one of us brought our cell phones that day. No kidding. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't have a cell phone, <laughs> so we kept ticking them off. And what did we get about halfway and we sat down? We stopped twice. Twice we twice sat. Twice in that. Yeah. And then just, I just lay down. Yeah, you had, Lay down yeah. Get your feet, oh, your feet you had to get your feet off the road. You know, yeah. they were just burn Like, they were burning. Hot. Like it was, like, hot just from all that friction. Like, yeah. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, we'd sit down for about five minutes and eat a candy bar or something. We'd get up and pitter-patter along again, you know. And finally, we get down to, there was a log, one logging road that they were logging on to, and it was out, it was only, like, a couple of kilometers, two or three kilometers in from the main road. We got all the way to there. And we could see trucks had come out of there. And finally, you get up, and there's a, they got these what they call uh, uh, realigners. It, real, it realigns all the wood. They put it on sidewoods. And it's like big culvert rollers. And there was a truck there. We could see a truck. And Kev starts on a dead run up the road to that truck. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to have him drive, be driving away and be no. like chasing. Oh, yeah, he's, he's running. Me and Steve <laughs> walking. And Kev's like a dead run up the road there. And he caught the driver. And it ended up, he said he was the last truck out, wasn't he? Yeah. No it was way. The la- and it was At what mile or what kilometer was that? Well, that's at the end. We that were out. pavement. No way. We'd yeah. walk 29 kilometers, which we translated into 18 miles that night after hunting all day. And uh, so we got the guy, and he had a cell phone. And uh, we. Uh, he knew Steve. He knew Steve. That's right. He knew Steve because Steve, the guy, not the Steve, our buddy Steve, but yeah. Steve that we rented from the camp. His name was Steve, too, and he knew him. So he called, and we got him out of bed because now it's midnight. Quarter past. I think we left. I think when we left the fire that Kev had, it was quarter past six, and it was was six thirty. And we got to the end of the road; it was twelve fifteen. Yeah, right? we did it in six hours. Six hours, oh. and then when we stopped and got a, you know, we got a hold of Steve, and he said he'd come get us, and uh, we got a fire going because we was going to stand there and freeze. We got another fire going, and then Steve showed up, took us back to camp. We got back there about. Two in the morning, probably. Yeah, he brought us snacks. He brought us some snacks, and then Steve had to be on the plane at 6.30 in the morning. So the other Steve, uh, Moore, that we rented the camp from, he he went home and he come back and picked us up and got Steve to the airport at 6.30, drove back in the woods and towed my Ram Charger out for me to the Dodge garage in town. And I got it in there, and you know what it was wrong with it? Had a corroded ground wire. No. Yeah, that's it. 
It's always a ground. Yeah, it's always a ground. And that did. That I, was how many hours was it? That was like another six hours trying to figure that. That wasn't a short. I don't know how many fix hours we got it. No, they couldn't figure it out yeah. that that afternoon, and they said that one of the mechanics had the manual on it because you see it's an eighty an eighty two. He had the manual at home, and they had it fixed for a thing in the morning. They traced just traced wires, and that's what yeah. it was uh, ground wire for the ignition. And uh, all I all I don't know how many hours, but I remember the bill was seven hundred something dollars. Oh, <laughs> for a bad ground for wire. For a bad ground wire. <laughs> and I'll well, tell you, one of the worst things about that walkout was I didn't have anything else to drink, so I'm like, I'm just gonna, I'll just grab some snow just to wet my mouth, not thinking. I go over to the snowbank and just scoop some, throw no. it in my mouth, and I, it was like throwing a mouthful of a handful of sand in my mouth because all that yeah. dust gets in the yep. snow i didn't realize I'm like, oh my god, oh my god. Oh. so we, we went th- we got about two hours sleep or three hours sleep anyways and we woke up and my feet were still hot no i mean they were hot i could still feel my feet hot i i looked at kev i go hey kev your feet hot and he goes yeah they're hot yeah still hot in the morning there wow and, and i ended up uh I don't think you ended up with any percussions in your feet, did you? No. I ended up, like, a month or so later, I lost a pinky toenail. All of a sudden, it just turned black, black. and fell off. It was the strangest thing. It wasn't black then. It was, like, like after deer season or something, after Christmas, and all of a sudden, my pinky toe went black. No kidding. Steve's yeah. like, I, I think I could hunt today. I yeah. Hunt. Yeah. <laughs> Steve, yeah, Steve goes, like, yeah, I'd be all right to go another day. Yeah. <laughs> oh. So, anyways... Oh. Uh, that's another misadventure by Hal Blood. That's another misadventure. We'll uh, we're gonna go back up on that other story though a little bit. Yeah, we'll be right back. Yes, yeah, Hal, I got a little PSA for you. That's public service announcement. So uh, just want to let you know what I'm doing. A, a couple of events I'm doing here right off, and uh, September eighth, I'll be in St. Albans, Vermont at the Whitetails Unlimited Banquet. I think there's still a few tickets available for that, but I'm sure it's filling up fast. And then the next day, the 9th, I will be down in at Coyote Creek, down in Rochester, New Hampshire, giving a seminar or signing books or whatever they want me to do there. But I'll be down there and like to see you there and talk about deer hunting. And in September, we always get revved up for it, so... That's what I'm up to in the next month. Hey, guys, this is Joe. Just wanted to take a few minutes and talk a little bit about the lodge. Uh, it's Lake Parlin Lodge. We're up here just south of Jackman, and we're going to be doing some specials this deer season on our lodging. All the cabins are uh, fully outfitted, modern, full kitchens, real comfortable accommodations. All of our packages are going to be Sunday to Sunday. We've got one bedroom, two bedroom two bedrooms with lodge rooms. We've got what we call the mini lodge, which is a five bedroom, five bath for big groups. So check us out at lakeparlinlodge.com and and check out our packages and come up and hunt the area. This is where the the big woods bucks live. Look forward to hearing from you. So Kev, we had that long walk out with our hot feet, but that that was a culmination of a really fun week we had there in Ontario, huh? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I think it was the second day I shot my buck there and, and, uh, you ended up filming it. Somehow everything came together. We we had kind of separated in the morning, I remember, and then we'd got that little snow, and I found this track and called you on the radio, and you come over and decided to to uh, film me taking that buck there. And So that, that hunt is going to be uh, coming right out. That's going to be on the Big Woods Bucks club side of the website the 15th of this month, so it's coming right out. Right around the same time this podcast will, so I'll have to keep an eye out for that one. I don't think I've watched that yet. Yeah, it's a good one. It's a it was a fun hunt. Nice buck, nice big old buck that was run right out, you know. Because I I was it was so cold that when Hal was kind of sorting it out and that like I was like I have to go walk like I have to go get on my own track. Cause just standing there, it's like it's just different when you you're working on a track, even if you're not moving that much, but. Whatever it is, you and you know, I was just like, hell, I'm like, I got to go find my own track and get on it. I'm like, I'm, I just couldn't do it. And I, I, I only got, you didn't, I, uh, maybe a hundred yards yeah. from you, and I get the call in the radio. Hey, I get, I get it squared away here. It's, yeah, he had. Uh, so, did you do a lot of filming in those days? All the time. Yeah, yeah. 
All the time I did. Kev was yeah. like top top filmer back then, you know. Yeah, because he could go. Yeah, and he grabbed his camera, but he, he did it more. That was back when we really, you know, wanted to get more footage from all the team guys. And, and quite frankly, most of the guys really didn't know much about filming, you know what I mean? And and what really you needed to capture. And then back in them early days, so much stuff got by us that we thought was irrelevant, you know. And... I mean, if we had the footage that we could have had, if somebody just turned a camera on, like you say, you should have filmed this, you should have filmed that. We didn't think about it back then, you know. But now we do. We're mindful of it that don't take anything for granted. Get the film footage when it's there because you might not see that same thing again, you know. Right. It's tough, too, because you've all, when you've been in the killing business for all these years and then you got to kind of make the transition to, like, now we're in the filming business. I mean, you know, in a sense that you got to make that commitment. You know, to say, all right, I'm going to stop. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And it's not easy. No. Yeah. A lot of people say they think, well, if I'm filming, it's cutting my chances back or seeing the buck or getting the buck. But what I found, and I used to think that way because I started, my first one I filmed track and then I shot it was in 2010. And it's not a very long hunt because I didn't turn the camera on a lot. Once I got, I knew I was getting pretty close behind him I didn't turn it on much but um, what I figured out after doing it for a few years like that that filming doesn't it's all about when you catch up to a buck anyways you got to it's two points connected I always said at the right place at the right time and maybe the filming makes the two points connect better I don't think it is one way either either way or the other you're going to catch up at the right point sooner or later so I just realized that uh, filming doesn't seem to affect that until you're close. I mean, once you get the buck and you know he's 10 minutes in front of you, well, it's pretty hard to stop and film. But but other than that, when you're just getting along on the track, trying to catch up, there's none of that really matters too much, you know? And that's why I think I was, when I first saw the GoPro on TV advertised, I'm like, that's it right there. That's something that I can strap on and at least get that footage in between stopping and just the fill-in stuff, you know? And yeah. if I wind up, because I can't, I'm not going to be able to stop filming. Yeah. I'm not going to be able to film and then set up my camera and then shoot at a deer, mm. you know, in that situation. And the GoPros now have that, the, uh, they're zoomed in. They're more of the, the not so much the person's lens. first person, pers- right. It's more of the perspective that you see. Because, you know, the GoPros for yeah a long time, I quit using them because you couldn't see anything on them. Yeah. Everything you know, what like would be it. clear to you and what you would see perfectly. Oh, yeah. You turn the GoPro on and it's a little brown spot, you know, and you got to yeah. point it out. But yeah. but that, that was, and the, the Tacticam is, a, I think, a five power zoom. Yeah, the new ones are, yeah. It makes was, for a nice film. Yeah. No, it just that was a situation, you know. Do you so always do sell you film do. now? I haven't. I think someone stole my GoPro, so I really haven't <laughs> done it since then. Oh. And I, you know what? And I haven't been, um, I've been really hunting in central New Hampshire and we just haven't had the snow. So it just it hasn't panned. I'm surprised out. you don't find your way up here every year. Well, I've got He's, he I've gets got invited. A, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I get a I get a 75 Jeep CJ5 that I'm I bought probably four years ago, and I'm still taking long, quiet rides with her to try to build up our trust and relationship. I've had <laughs> a, a, a whole hard time with her over the last few years. So, uh, so this year, knock on wood, I've been running up to Pittsburgh here and there. So that's yep. a couple. Two and a half hour ride, so uh, so yeah, I'm gonna put it to the test this year and make a little adventure of it and ram her up there. And yeah, it's gonna go one way or the other. Yeah. You know, reconcile or it's gonna be divorce. One of the two. I got some new hunting grounds you might want to check out. Yeah. All right. Yep. All right. Sounds good to me. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyways, you shot a nice buck a couple days later. We both had our bucks when Steve showed up. I think. I no, shot, no, no. That's right. Steve had showed up. Yeah. And yeah, because you're trying to tell me that I shot Steve's deer. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> we were on a we were on a track working out a track, and and uh, and we hear this. There was a series of clear cuts with strips of woods in between and ravines, and we hear this shot like not too far away, and a couple other shots, and I'm like, huh, geez, that's kind of like right out in front of us. I'm like, I wonder if he shot this buck, you know? So we just kind of hustled along on the track, come out in the cut. And there's Kev standing there over a dead buck. And I said, this must have been the buck. And 
And then he told us where it came from. He'd been tracking it, and we got looking around, and it wasn't. They just happened to the tracks cross paths out there in the cut. in the cut. But that was was that the furthest one you shot? Because I remember that was out in that cut, and it it, it looked pretty it looked like an ant out there in the GoPro footage. It it was it was a ways away. It's probably the same. Just yeah, probably they were both right there, hundred yards. Good roughly. hundred yards, yeah, yeah. But it yeah. It's funny, you know, when you say a good hundred yards, there's a lot of guys probably listening to this that are like, a hundred yards? That's not a long shot, you know, because some people just hunt fields and everything yeah, elsewhere. With, with scopes, too. Yeah, right. A hundred yards of the scope really isn't nothing, but when you got a peep sight or a – And a 44. Sight, yeah. yeah. No, I know. <laughs> it's <laughs> pretty, pretty challenging. That's impressive. I've got to yeah. tell you. <laughs> I, just don't I had never that. heard that part of your, uh, your hunting uh, – Repertoire. Habits, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I just I'm sure I got a you little use, money too. <laughs> use what you're familiar with. Yeah, yeah, that's right. No, and I actually picked that buck up right from where you guys took those deer that you were on, and that buck track was under your tracks. Yeah, they probably there was some does over in that corner. They were just probably all checking on them does or something. Good buck, Kevin. Yeah, it was like it was a, a nice one. Nine pointer. Yeah, yeah, nice. It was nine. nice when I start like when I start lift its head. I'm like, yeah, all right. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, we figured it. We didn't have no scale then either, but we figured his was like 225, didn't we? Oh. Yeah, especially when you cleaned them out and it's like the buttholes like that. Like, yeah, you know, like it was a nice buck, big, big buck. Yeah, and, and so you had already got yours at that point. Yeah, I shot mine. I th- we think it was the second day because I think the first day we'd found that caribou buck track or something, wasn't it? Was that the time? Uh, the caribou buck track. That was that was the beginning because we had to, we went down there to get away from all them tracks and just try to kill that one. Yeah, and then we went over there and I shot that one and then we went back over there and me and Steve kept trying to follow that caribou buck every day. I can't or something. believe we never killed that thing. I know. Well, it was kind of crunchy. Remember. Out in the cuts, you were all right, but in the woods, it was, we only had like, I don't know, two inches of snow, and it was so cold, every day the snow would evaporate. So then we were down to an inch, and then in under the trees, it was just a dusting, and it was cold, so every blade of grass snapped. Remember that? You couldn't, you couldn't walk nowhere without crickety crack, crack, crack in the woods, you know? Mm. So, well, got, I remember it was crunchy because remember we were up on top, like this little plateau, and then all of a sudden we hear like, and we thought, thought it was a squirrel that's right and it was wound up we went out to this cut turned around came back followed the track and it was that buck just down below us we heard him go by but we thought thought it was just another deer and and we knew we were right behind the other one so we pushed right along on the other one and he went over into a down a ravine and crossed below a beaver dam went into this other cut in the corner and came right back on his track and went below that ledge if we'd have just we had to run, what, probably 30 yards Maybe. over to the edge and look down over, and he walked right along it. And then he laid down within 100 yards of there. We we jumped him up there, you know. No way. Yeah, that's <laughs> stuff that happens. But we got the other one. We never got – we called it the caribou buck because it was the biggest track I'd ever seen in Ontario. You know, they just – on average, the tracks aren't as big. But this track, when me and Kev first see it, when we was driving down this – new road system they had just made some new cuts and we'd never been there and all of a sudden we see this track and we get out we're both like you gotta be kidding me it was a great big round and his hoofs were like rounded on the end like a caribou there and it was monster you couldn't lose the track anyway you know there was no other buck track up there like that and me and steve ended up tracking that like about five days in a row and got near it every day and near it, but it just, you could hear it go, you know, it'd crack, crack, get up and go, but it was so noisy the whole time that we just couldn't make it, couldn't get it. I think a trip back out there is in the cards for me. I yeah. enjoy it out there. Yeah, I'd go again with snow. I wouldn't go back there without snow right now. There just isn't enough, enough deer to make it worth its while, but with snow, I'd go again. Yeah. Yeah. I can think of a few places I'd like to go. But. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then that wasn't that when we drove back, we got, we got the Ram Charger fixed that day, and we packed up and we drove back, and didn't we? It was like freezing rain and sleet and snow and everything all the way home, chugging along in the Ram Charger there. And With track. Super Swampers on it. With super Swampers. Yeah, that mm. must have been fun. Quiet. Yeah, we had to we had to lock it in four wheel drive. I mean, it was the 
We got out one time. I told I was driving. I said, "Geez, Kev, I think the road it didn't. It was black, you know, but you couldn't tell if it was rain, a freezing rain. And because in that old thing, there's no thermometer. I said, I'm gonna get out. I gotta stop and see if this was freezing on the road. Jumped out of the ram chad. You almost fell down. The road was just like a bottle of ice. Locked it in and just started creeping. Track the trailers think flying by. Yeah. Really, they go by and you couldn't even. You couldn't even see nothing. You just haul over and wait for everything to clear and keep going. Remember, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> gas used to be an issue when we first started going out there. Yeah. Getting gas. <laughs> yeah. Planning our stops there. I remember being on the side of the road with a snow machine on its yeah. side, pouring gas out of the yeah. tank so we could <laughs> fill up the <laughs> truck with it in a, in a snowstorm. Oh, jeez. What's it, 20, 24 hours or so out there? 32, ain't it? Well, it's... If you got if you don't have any weather you can make it in about twenty eight. Yeah. But if when we used to go like in December, that late season, I mean you almost never could go without hitting snow somewhere across there. So and that must would, be like eighteen hundred miles or something. Uh, I can't remember what yeah, it is. That's a haul. I remember yeah, I when, flown out when I went. Yeah, it probably is because I remember the first trip. Me and me and Woody sat down and we figured it all out on a map to figure out how far it was. And uh we figured it was 1,200 miles, so we're all right. That's good. And so we're figuring, yeah, I will probably make it in 18, 20 hours or something. So we get we get to the 18, 20 hour mark, and we're like, we're about halfway there. And we're like, huh? How can that be? Well, when we had the map of Canada, it was it was kilometers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was, uh-huh. But something was different about yeah, it. Uh-huh. Wouldn't that don't sound right? It should have been more kilometers. But I don't know how we figured it. If the scale was in kilometers, and we figured some other way but we figured out real quick it was yeah it was probably closer to 1800 miles yeah but yeah well we had a lot of good times over the years we went about 10 years out there and yeah a lot of good times no that was fun especially when it was like the, we used to do it kind of like as the guides hunt kind of like after the season yeah, yeah that's how yeah. we kind of got it going so we could all go and and hunt on our own and just have fun and is that why you went to eastern ontario because of the well, let's that not, one ends later there, doesn't it? We didn't, we went to Western, Northwest. Yeah, because you don't have to have a guide there. Because oh, I thought it was okay. A, I thought Dryden was on the eastern part. No, it's only uh, two hours from Kenora. Okay, east. Yeah, but it was a zone. It was the only zone that had a season late enough where we could go. The rifle season in that zone went till, uh, and I think it still does, goes to December fifteenth, and for everybody, non-residents, because the Kenora zone. Uh, it's only two week zone for non residents. You can right. go the first couple of weeks in November, and then it closes for non residents. So that's the only reason I picked that area. I went, I studied all the laws, and and you didn't need a guide there, and the season fit where we needed, and that's the only reason we ended up there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good times. Yeah, I think I don't know if I'd go back. I don't know. I think there's a lot of untapped places in the lower 48. I think. There. Yeah. yeah. You can ram yeah. around yeah. where. No one's even thinking of it. If I had, well, I mean, obviously, yeah. if I, I'd have to pick, you know, if I had to pick. Right. I went, yeah. I think I went right at the tail end of when it was, like, when it was starting to drop off, right before the bad winter, and uh, there was a lot of deer there. Yeah. I was in the Kenora area, just north of there, and, I mean, it was, we didn't have any snow. Oh, my God, if we would have had snow, it would have been. Yeah. It would have been a lot more fun, but it was it was a lot of fun without snow. I mean, yeah. there were so many deer, you could you could just creep around in those ledges and. Yeah. Stay quiet and Yeah, that's I, the way it was when we went started going, but the snow actually was almost too much, wasn't it? When you get snow, there was so many tracks it was hard to sort, you know. Or it was too deep, like Kevin was saying earlier, so you gotta head for Montana. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that was just an excuse. <laughs> you know a funny thing with that trip when I was driving to Montana, I didn't I just had my truck packed. No, the time when I came out from Montana and met you guys and I was going back to Montana. I hadn't shot a deer, but we had shot a few deer that um, that week. So I'm going back through the Canadian border at, I don't know, Great Falls. Not Great Falls, wherever it was. International Falls? Yeah, I think it might yep. have been International. So I'm talking to the, the agent there, and he's like, so did you shoot shoot anything? I'm like, no. Nope. He's like, you have nothing in the coolers? I'm like, no. Nope. He's like, you didn't shoot any anything? I'm like, nope. I didn't. He's like, all right, pull over. So I pull over, get up to another guy. He's like, so you didn't shoot anything? I'm like, no, I haven't. I'm like, you look in the coolers, they're empty. I mean, I didn't I didn't get none, you know, nothing. So he's like, all right, we're going to have to search a vehicle. So I'm like, all right. 
So I get out, and all of a sudden I realize what they're talking about because on both sides of my truck there was huge blood stains all the way down the rear quarter <laughs> panels because when we backed up to the game pole, it was rubbing on the other deer when we had the deer in the back of the truck. So like, I had no idea. Like, oh, all right. Now I know why everyone. Uh, I didn't even know. Tom, idea. that was your flame job? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, exactly. Uh, yeah. Hmm. No, those are, yeah. So guiding the... You went after you was guiding. You went when you moved back down. You started doing a little logging with, with Lee, right? Yeah, Lee and I <laughs> yeah. were logging. That was good times. That was like during the, the crash, wasn't it? Like in oh, 08 and yeah, 09 or a, something. That and was the end of a. Uh, I don't know how you describe. End it. of an era, wasn't it? End of an era. <laughs> I want to talk about putting all your eggs in one cot. <laughs> I did it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then the wolf got me halfway back to the five house day and cleaned me out. Yeah. Yeah. So when I met Kev there and he came down and started cutting wood, we had a, I owned a 440 John Deere skidder that I had kept for years there. And we were cutting wood and we were cutting wood for Southern Maine foresters there. And it was pretty good times, but. Like anything, you always see a golden nugget on the other side. So I said, well, let's, let's buy some more equipment. So we got tied up with this gal that sells equipment. <laughs> tied up? <laughs> tied up, yeah. When you deal with her, you get tied up. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And uh, so we bought some old John Deere equipment, and it was one thing right after another. And I can remember we was cutting wood up in uh, – Sutton, New Hampshire, I think it was, right on yeah. top of this mountain. Wouldn't nobody else cut it. But I That's told them we guys, there. we'll cut it. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we had a skidder that we could put a clutch in in about three and a half hours, right on the landing. No lie. No lie. <laughs> we had that down pat. <laughs> I was just telling someone that. How, and, many, uh, how many did you put in it? Oh, depending on who was driving. <laughs> <laughs> did we do two? Or was that the rear end? We, we did. did two on one landing right there in Sutton, two of them. In, yeah, right there. And then we had a, what was it, hydro axe yeah. with a blade on it there, a saw head, and that thing wasn't worth its weight, you know. That so I can remember it was a good fuel tank because we'd go drain fuel out of that <laughs> to put in the skitter so we could keep going. Anyways, uh, yeah, that was a good time. I remember one night we had a landing full of wood, couldn't find a truck. Them guys were all busy. And uh, both pieces of equipment broke down. Needed about $10,000 worth of repair work. And it was about $11,000 worth of wood on the landing. <laughs> <laughs> and we couldn't get a truck. And uh, so my wife called and said, why don't you get home? I said, all right, we're headed that way. So we counted up the money between the two of us. We had seven bucks. <laughs> and I had a quarter of a tank of fuel in that big F-250 I had. And I knew that was just about enough to roll into Porter. We'd yeah. get that close to home. We were good. And we stopped at the Irvin station there. And uh, Kev says, what do you want to do? I said, oh, no. He says, we got seven bucks, Lib. What do you want? I says, I need a pack of Marlboro Lights. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at least you never lost your priorities. Uh, we well, sucked that pack of cigarettes down until we got home. <laughs> Thank God my wife was a sweetheart and... The table was covered with food, and the liquor cabinet was full when we got home. <laughs> Drowned our sorrows. But we shortly, it wasn't long after that, we came to the realization that we had to find something else. Back yeah. then, it was hard, and all the woodcutters, you know, were they were taking care of themselves. It was hard to get your wood trucked off of land, and I don't care how hard you worked to put it there. It was harder to get rid of it. And... uh so we tried something else. That's when I ended up moving to Rangeley. That yep. was 2010. Yeah. And you headed back to New Hampshire. But yeah. We had spent yeah. a couple of years there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We split a lot of firewood, too. Yeah, split a lot of firewood. I had an old uh, 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 woods, wood splitter that went on the back of a Kubota tractor that I'd bought. And I took that wood splitter and a welder, and I made a firewood processor out of it. And we'd split and deliver wood every single day. That was pretty we do, good. Yeah, we we do probably like should have stuck to that. Day, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we'd cut it off the stump, haul it to the land, and cut it up, split it, put it in the truck, and deliver it every single day. Yeah. On top of whatever logs and pulp we could get out. That yeah. was fun. Then I remember we bought a 210 Prentice, a slasher. It had a big saw on it. 
guy cut us a deal on that. That was a pretty good piece of equipment. And uh, I built a D limma for it. We looked at D limmas. Yeah. We were cutting a big hemlock stand. Yeah. And we looked at D limmas. They were about 20 grand back then for a small one. I told Kev one night, I said, I think I can build one of them. So we went to the scrapyard, the iron place there in Portland. Yeah. We bought a couple hundred dollars of steel and put it in the garage. And two nights later, we came out and we had a D limma. Yeah, you had made it. Yeah. yeah, put it in the back of the truck, took it up there and set it on the, the gooseneck on that slasher trailer. And yeah. I bolted it down. I thought, geez, I hope this holds up. <laughs> I don't know how many cord of wood we pulled through that thing, but a lot. No, that did yeah. the trick. That yeah. saved a lot. You just put the tree, the, the tree in it and just pull it right through it? And yeah, I had I had taken the design. I just took a... I looked at one online there and, uh, yeah, basically took a round piece of, what was it, five-eighths pipe or something and yeah. cut it and made some knives out of it. We sharpened up some knives and took an old piece of railroad tie, I think it was, or something, and welded on the end for a counterweight, and you'd swing that over and lift that bar up and set it in, and that would clamp down onto itself and just ride mm -hmm. there, and you'd suck that tree through it. and Yeah, it worked good. Yeah. Yeah. Save Saved a lot, a lot of saw work. A lot of saw work, yeah. Definitely with all that but, yeah. up in there. But a lot of character building came out of that. <laughs> yeah. You know? I remember, I'll tell one more story about the, the log in there. But <laughs> we were broke again one night. <laughs> <laughs> it was dark and cold. Again or still? <laughs> <laughs> you want to talk about Feast of Famine. I can remember when we get a check for a thousand dollars. We thought we were something else until right. we did the math and realized we owed eleven $1 hundred. <laughs> <laughs> a man can live on beer and cigarettes. Yeah, yeah. But we were eating beans and hot dogs there, staying in a little camp up in New Hampshire. It was it was just short. We might as well have been right outside because where we were staying, they'd only turned the heat up to about fifty. Right. We took cold showers with the spiders there. <laughs> yeah. When we did take a shower, but. I remember one night a friend, my wife actually called and said, why don't you go get yourself something good to eat? There's a restaurant right up the, the street there. So she said, I'll call and pay for your meal. I'll give her my credit card number and you guys go eat dinner. So me and Kev was pretty excited. So we went up there and, and uh, sitting at the bar and having a drink. And this gal walks in and she's probably in her late 50s, early 60s. Beautiful woman, absolutely beautiful woman. She sat down next to Kev there, and she started right in talking about she was going to meet a guy on a blind date that her kids had set her up on. So she was nervous, and we were trying to put her at ease. And she said, I just got a bad feeling about this fella. I just got a bad feeling. So sure enough, about the time they were supposed to meet, in walks this fella, and she said, I knew it. And he wasn't the most attractive gentleman and was dressed a little... Probably worse than we were. <laughs> a couple say, of loggers yeah, just come yeah. out of the woods there. And uh, this fellow walked right over to her and said, are you so-and-so? And she looked right at him and says, nope. <laughs> <laughs> she looked at Kev and started talking like nothing had ever happened. And I thought, huh, that poor fellow, yeah. you know. So he walks off. She sits there and we eat our dinner and she chats with us and she said something about going home to make chocolate chip cookies for her grandkids. I said, chocolate chip cookies sounds good. She says, I've got a whole Tupperware thing full of chocolate chip cookies in the back seat of my car. I says, you do? She says, yes, I do. Would you like one? I said, I would love one. So we follow her out to the car there, and she had had a couple of martinis by then, and she was rubbing Kevin's shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> and she just thought he was the most adorable thing in the world. So she made mention of maybe Kevin ought to come help her make some chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> and he says, no, no, I can't. She says, are you sure? And I, Kevin says, yeah, I'm pretty sure. I says, I tell you what, I'll make a deal with you. I'll let you make out with my friend <laughs> for a chocolate chip cookie. <laughs> Well, she reached up and grabbed Kev right by the ears, <laughs> and she put a lip lock on him, and I shoved my face into that Tupperware jar, <laughs> and I ate cookies until he couldn't breathe anymore, <laughs> and we went on our way. Oh, God. Oh. Kev taking one for the team. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Shane, I don't I even think, think he got a cookie. No. <laughs> I think I got your prime rib dinner, too, once, didn't I? Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh. That was a lot of fun. Good times. Yeah, a lot of fun. Hey, everyone. Hal here. You want to join the hunting club as soon as you can because that's where you're going to get all my information. 
I'll have uh, short film hunts, video tips, articles every month, and uh, there's also a forum on there for you people to communicate. Maybe you'll meet a new hunting buddy on there. And the other thing is a question of the month. Submit a question, and uh, I'll pick one to one every month to uh, answer. And the winner is going to end up getting a decal for their truck. Join up at bigwoodsbucks.com. Hope you enjoy it. So is this the Big Woods Logging Podcast or the Big Woods Bucks Podcast? <laughs> <laughs> I think it all. Not that I didn't enjoy uh, all your guys reminiscing old yeah. times. Well, let me make one point here before we carry on. All of this stuff that's fun and things that happen in life, it's all part of it because their right. experiences logging and hardships and stuff that helps you even in your deer hunting. A lot of yeah. people would never relate that, but it really does, you know, because if you can, you know, live in an old lumber camp in 50 degrees and take cold showers, it, it toughens you up, you know. You just, it just helps with your experience in life, you right. know. Wasn't a day went by we didn't talk about deer hunting. Oh, it's, it's probably what kept you going. No, no, well, absolutely, because it was kind of like work now and then hopefully. So you guys fall. had already guided together before that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's yeah, this you, was after. Yeah. This was. This was really out. wasn't that long ago. No, I mean, seven, ten, eight years. Yeah, seven, eight years ago. Nine years. Yeah. yeah. I really think that we should just off the cuff here. I think we should have another outfit in business. <laughs> I think, <laughs> yeah, because I miss those days. I know it wasn't big money. It wasn't probably what we make now, but you can't find a better quality of life than what we had. No, you're right. I mean, I was we we got paid very well, but I always told people it's you know it's a hell of a life, but not much of a living when you get to patch it all together. But mm-hmm. I mean, we did get paid paid very well for what we did, but uh, to patch it all it, together, it is impressive. I'm always, you know, when you see someone, and I think we talked about it before that that truly makes their entire year round living off of guiding, and and there's not a lot of those guys around. No, you know that that's all they do, and uh, it it's got to be challenging. Yeah, you know. I think if you go like New Zealand or something in the off season, and come back. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> but uh, so you so you had said earlier when you first started uh, hunting up here, you really hadn't tracked that much. So probably had, what seventeen, eighteen years ago is when you started tracking. Yeah, well, you know what? I guess like I like to say I was following deer because whenever we had snow, I'd follow deer because that's really I guess people would consider that tracking. But at that time, I was just following them. You know, I had read yeah. the books, the Benoits and what have you, and uh, watched some videos, but I just didn't, I was trying, but it, it wasn't tracking. And I think a lot of people don't realize that when they first start, they're following, and then they have to, after following and following and following, you slowly make that transition to where you're actually tracking them. Right, yeah, you're learning all the time. Yeah, yeah, and you can sort and do all those other things. So, yeah, and then when I came up here, I just gave me the opportunity to hunt the snow right out my back door and then also take four weeks or five weeks and hunt steady the whole time and so that just expedited my learning curve i mean that takes some people that's five years right there you know cause mm. did you ever do a success rates hal with with uh all your clients through the years did you ever sit down i know you you and mike had sat down one time and calculated all the moose that you had gotten when you were doing that, but did you yeah. ever do that with deer and what your success rate was? No, not really, because I always considered it, a lot of people consider the success rate is how many do you kill, but the reality with, with guiding is for every one you kill, there was two more that got away that should have been killed, yeah. you know, and that's, it really is a reality. I mean, mm-hmm. I know these guys can tell you too, the amount of times you see a buck get away that just should have been dead, it's just... It's it's mind-boggling almost. So no, I never really bothered with that. But the one thing, the one thing I did notice over the years when we first started our business, it was the the deer hunters changed. You know, in the beginning when we first started in the early '90s, the hunters were more just about shooting a deer. You know, they'd shoot any buck, and we most of the time we'd have anywhere from six to ten bucks every week on the pole. But Five or six of them would be yielding bucks, you know, spike horns and crotch horns. And then there was a changeover point there. And then back then, but most of them, most of the hunts were like uh, the guys that just were do-it-yourself. You know, they'd go on their own and maybe they'd have meals or cook their own or whatever. 
we didn't have as many guided hunts back then and i think actually in the beginning all the guided hunts was just me and another guy doing a remote hunts and then i started my one-on-ones it was smaller and then all of a sudden it kind of started going the other way when there was more people wanting guides and i just think it was people just were willing to pay for that whether it was uh having the scouting done and they knew they could start from day one you know being in deer you know they they knew they didn't have to look around and and then that's when the guiding end kind of overtook the do it yourself is and about the same time is when maybe that was why the change was but there was uh it got to be more people looking for bigger bucks, you know. Well, I think that was also the early 90s, mid 90s was also when the monster bucks videos were really big and, you know, quality deer management was really hitting. And I think people's focus changed a little bit because that's all they saw. They saw these guys killing big bucks and here and you got to let the young ones go if you want to kill a big one. And yeah. maybe some of, some of that trickled down, even though it's a completely different kind of hunting, it, it's still yeah. the idea was. You know, yeah. QDMA was yeah. coming on strong at that point. It became more of a social issue, I think, as far as people wanting to shoot bigger bucks. Yeah. yeah. You know, point restrictions were starting to get talked yeah. about and all that stuff. Yeah. So when it was about the time when, when Kev and Lee started guiding because I needed more guides. I mean, it, sometimes we'd be five or six guides a week, wasn't there? Yeah. Guiding oh, deer full hunters. House. Yeah. Full yeah. House. Place was jamming, but we didn't kill as many bucks. And it's just because the guys were letting the smaller ones go and or you know, basically goofing up, you know. But just, we weren't we weren't tracking the small ones either. You know, we were we got on a buck track that we knew was a at least two hundred pounds and we'd go. We weren't even messing with them. I can remember telling a client on a sad day with his his crosshairs on a crotch on, do not shoot that deer. Yeah. <laughs> No. Oh yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, he had two that. opportunities that week to shoot monsters, uh, yeah. you know, over two hundred pounders. And on sad day, for some reason, he gets his crap together yeah. and lays her out on the crotch on. I'm like, <laughs> don't, do not shoot that deer. Yeah. So yeah. I don't think they had the opportunity, Hal, necessary, necessarily to, because they weren't out there just poking around. We were focused on right getting that big yeah. one. And I mean, it's no matter what, it's you're talking about success rate or what have you. It's the guide's knowledge and the hunter's ability. Right. That's the combination. And then that's that's pretty much going to dictate what you're going to be able to do unless you get really in a perfect, perfect situation. I think as far as an outfitting business, too, that your success rate has to almost be based on repeat customers. You know, because guys would come back year after year that didn't shoot bucks, but they were either had the opportunity or right. were really close or had learned enough to yeah they wanted to the want same to guides back. every year because if the right. guides did a good job they'd part of the job was the guides do a good job and the guys like them the clients then they'll come back that was their repeat work you know but i would say if i if i had to say anything about the success rate on the deer would be i would think by listening to the stories over the years and you know my hunters and stuff i bet it was around close to 50 percent of the guys could have shot any buck and a lot of them were good bucks that they either let go or not the big ones but let go smaller ones and goofed up on bigger ones i right. bet half of them had a chance yeah. Yeah. to shoot a buck which is incredible because the success rate statistically a deer that gets shot in maine is like 15 percent, and right. that's counting the does and everything yeah so you i'm sure you gave your spiel whenever someone would call to anyone that was new anyway about how this is not hunting on a farm and this is different and everything how often would you have guys come up that were surprised by it that were you know well this isn't what i thought it was going to be i mean did that happen very often or were people that came up they knew it when they came yeah you mean they they were surprised most of them were all set but we did have a few over the years i'll let you the fame most famous one i'll let you it was kev was guiding them and that was kind of a funny st- story kev didn't was think it? it was funny <laughs> yeah yeah kev didn't think it was funny but yeah, he was. Kev was upset about it because he tried to do so good and work hard for everybody. But, and I told, I made sure everybody knew, you know, the reality was, and this is what I would tell them that if you see five or six deer in a week, you've had a nice week. You might see a buck in it, and but the odds are, if you see a buck, it's probably going to be a a bigger buck than you're used to seeing. And that's what I tell people, and and some people. That, you know, that's why they came. They're like, yeah, yeah, that's okay, that's okay. They just wanted to 
hunt up north so bad that they, they maybe they didn't listen. I don't know. But what we did have people over the years would leave in the middle of the week, and they'd say, hey, yeah, food was great, everything was great, but this ain't for us. Mm-hmm. And that goes back to my saying is big woods hunting, you either love it or you hate it. Yeah. But I'm going to let you tell Kev, this, Kev can tell you the story about the, was I think it was a guy and his nephew. Or, yep, exactly. Yeah, yeah there was two. I'm going to, you got to tell both stories because you lost a gentleman from Boston, was it, who looked like he just stepped out of Muscle Fitness magazine and you lost him <laughs> on Wednesday, right? Ah, I'd have to think about yeah, that Yeah, he split out on Wednesday. We thought he was going to be a goer too. I'm like, you son of a gun, you got a yeah, goer got this lucky. week. Yeah. He ended up falling down. Yeah, I don't have to think back on that one. But I distinctly oh, no. remember the the uh, the guy and his nephew or something because he ended up ruining his nephew's hunt. Well, yeah, because well, we had hunt. We started off the morning, just gonna first day, first day. Just we're just gonna we're gonna hunt up through the notch, and then his nephew is just gonna go hunt around the bowl. We had no snow though, right? No snow. Yeah, so be just, a ground hunting. Yeah. So yeah. just you know, I had him. I told him you stop here. You come to this. Just stop right there. Blah blah blah. So the uncle and I are going up through the notch and we're, we're seeing a ton of moose just we happen to we're just like seeing a ton of moose and he's like oh my god this is great you know this is already my trip you know cow and calves all this is great blah blah, blah. and i had a couple radios and so i gave one to the nephew so we get back up to the road i try to call him can't call him can't get a hold of him so then i walk him back down the end the uncle back down he's not at the truck so i go all the way i hiked all the way back up to the notch found him didn't go where I told him to go and stop, what have you. Can't imagine that. Right. So, whatever, no big deal, right? So, then the end of the season prior to that, I had chased some bucks over in the spot, and I knew that buck was, I just knew that was his core area. So, I'm like, let's, we're going to go back over there. And it was classic main woods that have been cut, right? You got raspberries, you got slash, whatever. But he lived in there. Like, that was his core area. And this is the First week of the season, I think. Lots of rubs and stuff, wasn't there? <sighs> yes, there was. <laughs> <laughs> so I took him in there, whatever, we hunted that, and then we get coming back out, and then I can see someone someone didn't make it back to the truck in time to do their business. So I'm like, all right. So I said, why don't we just go back to the go back to Cedar Ridge, you get cleaned up, and take it from there because he wasn't feeling good at all. So we go back out for the morning hunt. And then hunted the next day, and the next thing you know, he's like, if I see another blah blah moose da 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 like Saul said I'm like he's flipping right here right in front of me like we're seeing it's all going south right now so I think it was I went up there Wednesday morning and they were gone they left Tuesday night and then and they had been started to tell me they're like well we like to do this where we hunt and then we like to do that in the middle of the day then we like to do this I'm like that's fine I'm like you can do that but that's not really how Big I kids. hunt, yeah, and you know exactly. So, what so typical the, of hiring a guide and then telling him how guide, yeah, guide, don't, how to don't guide. guide the guide. Yeah. yeah, and then they started writing all sorts of stuff about like I would. They said that I took in like uh, I was showing them these rubs and stuff that they thought that I had taken my knife <laughs> and made the rubs. <laughs> oh, nice! And that like I gave them like faulty. Uh, radios. I'm like, I don't even have to give you radios. You know what I mean? I'm like, just like, right. just trying to make sure we're as, can get in contact if we need to. He was like a ranger or something like that. So I'm like, why? He should have been all set. But uh, so yeah, that was. Yeah, I remember. They like is the, the type that don't want to say nothing to you, to your face, to your face. So they they leave in the middle of the night. They were just gone by Wednesday morning. They were gone, and then I get a phone call like that night. When I get in, I get a phone call from the guy, and he wants half his money back because they only spent half the week. And I'm like, uh, I don't think you're getting any money back. I said, it's you paid for your hunt. Guides paid. That's how it works. You left for some reason. And then he was on and on about Kevin. I'm like, I'm like, right now you got to stop talking because you ain't going to convince me anything you're saying is even remotely true. So, and he got mad at me. And then he started going on every forum. Back then, there wasn't as many, but any place he could find about deer hunting on the, on the Internet and writing bad stuff about wow. us. Wow. And then he actually went so far as to write to the Guides Association, the, the Commissioner of Fish and Wildlife, about his guided hunt. Oh, yeah, he went that far. 
And uh, of course, everybody knew, you know, I mean, I'm on the board of directors for the Guides Association, you know, and everybody know the guy was a clown. So so basically what you're saying is in one day's time. Two days. Well, he hunted two days, but the first day he was happy. So yeah. Tuesday is when it, it flipped. Yeah. And then one day all this happened. Yeah. yeah. And, he, and he, after he was told what to expect and all that, so... You must have really ticked him off, Kevin. For anybody, for so. anybody out there listening, <laughs> I'd like to see him again to tick him off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> for any of you guys listening, don't be that guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you yeah. wanna, if you wanna hire a guide and and uh, you know do your thing and learn and stuff, do it. But uh, don't act like that. You know, stick the week out. Maybe you didn't click with your guide or one for one reason or the other. You didn't like the area you're in. Fine research another place for the next year but put yeah, your see, time in yeah you're saying we were hunting like raspberry fields I'm yeah like, like yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. my favorite place to hunt in the old raspberry <laughs> fields <laughs> you know like. so that's it that's all ties in with you know the success of a hunt is basically what the hunter gets out of it you know and even anybody going on their own and i think nowadays we've talked about it before you know with the internet and Facebook and all of that stuff, social media, people have so much access to information that they just get on overload, I think, and they can't sort things out. And quite frankly, I read a lot of the stuff on there. I kind of, I'm forced to monitor as much as I hate to a lot of the things on there. Like, And the post is just, I can tell right off when people are just, you know, they ain't, they're headed the wrong direction, you know. I- I'm actually dealing with that from the other end right now because I'm I'm just starting in the early stages of planning a self-guided moose hunt to Alaska, and it's like that. I mean, there's so much out there, and in Alaska especially, there's so many units and, and so much information and so many variables that you have to deal with, and everyone's got an opinion on it. And uh, fortunately, there's some great resources, really good sites, and a lot of people to talk to, but it it's like drinking from a fire hose when you first start, mm, yeah. you know, and... You move along, and and uh, as you learn a little bit more, and you learn the questions to ask different people, it helps. But but I, I'm, I imagine it's the same way at first time coming here for someone. Oh, it's got to be. I know it's got to be a big task for them to try to find the right guide to go with, because there is a lot of guides that are just they're in it to get your money, and that's about the end of it. But if you you know, there's a way to sort through that stuff. You know, it's like going to buy a car or something. You know, you you know when you end up with a salesman you like or whatever and stuff but so you got to just do your homework and, and when you think about track if say if you're going to go on a track you want to get guided and you know when you're going to track i mean that's you look, look at any other type of hunting and whether it's hog hunting um duck hunting deer hunting whatever it may be that you have all these people that try to make it more difficult by bow hunting you know, whatever it is, right? I'm going to make yeah. it more difficult by bow hunting or using a crossbow or a longbow or a mu- even a muzzle loader, right? They have that progression of steps, muzzle loader, bow, to make it harder and harder. And when you talk about tracking a buck, no one's talking about, I'm going to make it harder or try to make right. it more of a challenge right. by not yeah. using a rifle. Right. It's that challenging that it's still, <laughs> yeah. it's still more of an accomplishment, I think, than bow hunting or... Oh yeah, other, I question. still feel handicapped with a muzzle loader. Right. Uh, yeah, I feel I'm like trying now to figure I out how to get an, uh, an AR with a thirty-round clip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, yeah, for sure. You know, it's so you got to take that in consideration. You, you know, no one's trying to make it harder. Right. Everyone's yeah. just trying to hold on. And <laughs> yeah. So we, Kev, we had a a question on the on the forum there. The question of the month when the guy asked uh the other day and he wanted to know when it he's been tracking some bucks and you know i don't know if he shot one that way probably not but it's a typical question it's a good question because it's typical and you touched on it a little bit is is when does he wanted to know from all the team members when did that uh click when did the track and really click and you said finally said i got this now i can do it you know was it the first time you shot one tracking or Whatever it was, and there is that time, because I thought that's why it's question of the month. I thought it was a really good question that everybody could relate to, because people, do they're doing it, and they're trying to learn. And there does become a point when it's like, I got it now. I can do it. And 
I answered. For me, it was the first one I shot. Finally, when I finally shot one tracking after seven years of, you know, stumbling around, and then it clicked. For me, that's when it all of a sudden, the whole thing clicked, and it was, you know, every year, you know. Yeah. So when was it for you, Kev? I would say it was my second year guiding or second year up season up in Jackman. I'd shot a deer the first year I was here. Um, and then the second year, I just was like, all right, I just want to track one. No matter, doesn't matter what it is. If it's a spike buck, I'm going to track it. And then I was just, for, then I like, then I saw an eight pointer, I let it go. Then I saw a six pointer, I let it go. And then it was just, we had a good season. And then it just started to kind of flow. And then the first buck I ever tracked and killed pretty much gave me every single different scenario or condition that you could whether it's going straight out it got into does it was searching all these different things um so i would say then it really just just doing it and then all of a sudden that second season i remember it was just kind of like it started ha- it just you know what it did i started having stories and then it just started happening it just yeah. all of a sudden like it just oh no kidding there he is like it worked <laughs> and then yeah. all of a sudden oh it worked again so I just think a lot of repetition and not being not being too crazy about when you especially when you first start and trying to get on the biggest track you can. You yeah, know? that's where people I, I I discourage people from that not not telling them if you see a big track don't take it but the new hunters if you're out there trying to just all you want to do is find a big track and take it it's going to be slow and painful because those are the hardest ones to kill. You know you gotta it's like anything you gotta practice a little bit first and and. Uh, and get good at it, you know. Then you can take on the big guy, you know. But, I, uh, I think for me, <clears throat> it was probably the second season. I mean, I was instantly hooked to the tracking part of it just because it was so, you know, it's the chase. It's it's You feel like more like a predator than you do sitting in a tree. And uh, it was probably my, I think my second season I came up here, late 90s sometime. Deer herd was good then, easy to find a, a track. And it was uh, the first time I'd actually caught up to a deer now. My head was down, and I didn't see it until it was running away, but I walked right up to him, and uh, that was that was it for me. Like, oh, I can actually walk up to one. And I think from there, not necessarily shooting one, but, but passing on one, like tracking one, and, and it's, you know, a small one that you don't want to shoot, but, but you, you saw him before he saw you, and that was that's the yeah. best thing there is. When you see them before they see you, that's there's the, no better feeling. That's the confidence. Yep. thing right there that hey i got this now and then then it from there it's just setting your sights a little higher after that yeah and you definitely start to get kind of like a sixth sense i think too oh there's no question you just develop yep. that like what he always said he could when he was following me the camera he said he'd see the hair stand up in the back of my neck <laughs> yeah i don't know that. that second season i i told the story before on another podcast i think but my brother we tracked one together and my brother shot a it was like a high 140s, 147-inch buck. I mean, we don't care our about, second. We don't care about that. How I much do. It, how much did it weigh? I do. It, it weighed 185. Yeah, see? And I'd, <laughs> Little I guarantee he'd do it all over again because it, it was an unbelievable rack. But anyway, that was, I mean, that was our, our we were just beginners, you know. And right. to, to shoot a buck like that, it was, I mean, I still see that buck when it, because I was there with him. Yeah, when yeah. he when he shot it, and I can still see that thing going down, and it's and it's he was trying to keep his head up, and he was he was on the ground, taking his last breaths, and oh, it was unbelievable. Yeah, and good time. I heard I heard that story, and I kind of had the same story. I think it was oh, was it two years ago when it got hit? And you shot you shot it in the hoof. Yep. But you just had that little speck of blood. That was it. That I had one of those two years ago, and I, I don't know where I hit it. Um, but it wasn't fatal. I think I hit it like the, just scun the leg or something, but I was always thinking to myself, this would be the perfect track for someone to be on. That was kind of just learning. Yep. It was just enough blood where you could all, you could tell, and it wasn't too far apart, but you could always just kind of tell, all right, yeah, I am on the right track. I am on the right track. And I was just thinking like, God, if I had someone with me that was trying to learn to track, it would be like, just, yeah, you know, you know, you just go ahead and track this one and you'll, you'll keep giving yep. you little indicators. Get, yeah, and let you know you're still on the right one. Right yep. track, yeah. 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 Hey, Lee, when did that click for you? I think we talked, might have talked about it before because it was, was it around when you come up to take my clinic? You were struggling a little bit. And you yeah. You the deer clinic. Yeah. I, yeah. You know, everybody knows my story about how I called you out of the blue. And, 
you don't know me, but you're gonna. That's <laughs> <laughs> how I meet a lot of people, but uh, yeah, just I can remember sitting in your deer clinic and stuff would like a revelation would come to my head. I'd be like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, yeah. But I still sometimes struggle because I am the most impatient person. I think sitting at this table no i don't i don't and, think so no <laughs> and uh it's gotta I can, be me <laughs> i can uh i can screw up a deer hunt on any given day you know easily but last year uh two friends of mine wanted me to go to a little place outside of rangeley and it wasn't a spot that i really wanted to go but they wanted me to go and i wanted to see them get a deer both of them had a doe tag and pretty good friends and they hadn't killed the deer in a while so i said i'll go poke around out there maybe i'll push something around and uh i got in the woods i cut a big buck track i got in the woods and that buck track kind of meandered up around a little bit and then this smaller buck track come across and it was much fresher and i said i didn't catch that buck and within a mile i looked down over a ridge and there's a little seven pointer walking away from me and but he had a narrow hind end and you know the first thing that comes to mind is Hal will never approve of this so <laughs> I watched him for a little bit and uh I actually went back and got one of my friends and tried to get him in front of it but I couldn't but anyway so I left there and headed up over the mountain and uh cut another buck track a little bit bigger one not a lot bigger but another big one but it was the only one around so I'm going to take that one and I'm screaming across this big hardwood ridge thinking, you can see a long ways, and I might catch it right here somewhere. I was going so fast, I walked right out of the track because he turned hard left. And as soon as I, you know, I'm watching where I'm going, watching, 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 I look down to verify I'm still on a track. The track's gone. I'm like, Err. So I turned around, came back. It was only 10 paces, and I see where he had taken a hard left up the hill. And there we go. <laughs> port arms let's walk up over this hill and i come up over the hill and i can see his horns and he's making his bed and i look down across his back and his back's high it's not swayed down at all and i'm thinking i know by the size of the track this 175 180 pound deer hal again is not going to approve but how cool is that that this is number two and i only got to take a couple more steps and i got him and i took those two steps and I pulled my gun up on him, and he looked at me, and he was about 16 inches wide, but he was real spindly, horned deer and smaller body. And he looked at me like, oh, crap. And he went off, and I was like, all right, I just got to do that with a 200-pounder. But, yeah. you know, it was just one of them perfect days. You know when you get out of the truck, and the snow's good, the wind's blowing, and it's swirly, and they're at a disadvantage, and you feel good, you're healthy, and... Today, I'm going to see a deer. Whether I shoot it or not, I'm going to see a deer. And that comes with a confidence that, you know, gets instilled with you from repeatedly doing it. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it is tougher. I mean, for not everyone has the the uh, luxury of living in it and being able to pick the good days. And yeah. so you got to deal. If you come on a six-day hunt or whatever, I mean, that's what you got to deal with. So you got to make the best of it. And Yeah. Well, that's all. That's how you learn. You yeah. learn all the conditions and how to hunt in them and all of that. You always got to have the right buck on the right day, no matter what, because yeah. you can have yeah. perfect tracking conditions, but you got a buck that's just searching. You just ain't, you ain't going to catch him if he, right. if he ain't finding any does or anything like that. And then you could have an awful conditions, and you got a buck late in the season that doesn't want to go anywhere, and you can't even get him out of a thicket. But <laughs> yeah. it's like, God. Yeah. You know, you just can't yeah. get. So, uh, Kev, I want to wrap. We've got not a lot of time left, but. I want you to tell a little story about your biggest buck you shot was with a muzzleloader, wasn't it? It was. It was with a White Mountain carbine. Oh, yeah. You're doing a little 50, advertising now? 54 caliber. <laughs> <laughs> no, just no, I know. it out there. Those were the thing back in the day, huh? Yeah. yeah. These calls I are... remember Featherstone had one of them there, and it was, he had a 54 caliber, and past 50 yards, you might as well have a slingshot. <laughs> right. <laughs> It was great. You can almost carry it like right on your forearm, like yeah. a pistol. Yeah, that's probably where I like them smaller guns. Um, so you want me to tell a story of it? Yeah, because it was a big buck. I mean, yeah, it was, was two two twenty nine December. Yeah. I don't know. Oh wow! Late Little muzzle that. late, late yeah. muzzle load of buck up here, weighing two twenty nine. Yeah. is a monster buck. Yeah, now is. that buck is a two seventy five early all day. Yeah, yeah. I saw him when he was two seventy five. I think too. Yeah. <laughs> Couldn't get him then, though. No, I didn't have a gun with me. 
But um, yeah, my brother Frank had come up, and I wound up going up the spot where I wouldn't guide because I knew he was up there. And then uh, we got like probably five, six inches of snow in the night and parked. I just figured, you know, everything's going to be covered over. So I told my brother, I said, just hunt on the north side of the mountain. Don't go to the south side today. If you can do it another time, but just get familiar with this side of the mountain. So I struck off the end of the road, and I just got going a little bit in the woods. Then all of a sudden, you see, like, those dimples. So I'm like, well, I haven't seen anything else. And the stride looked really good in the width. And I'm like, well, this is, I got this right now. So I'm following this. Dimples means mostly filled in with snow. Yes, the snow had filled it all in. And just you could see the little depressions there of the track. So I got on them, and we started going right up the mountain. Um, and then all of a sudden, we got into the green growth. And the kind of the cool thing was is following that buck around the green growth. He was literally right on the edge of it. So when you're following his track, you could see all the way out into the hardwoods. But you were in the green growth, just the way where he was walking. That's what they like to do. Right. And uh, we went around the whole mountain, and all of a sudden he bailed down. And now his track's getting freshened up. And then he gets into a bunch of does. So he's ramming does around. But he had a unique track. It was not super wide, but it was long, really long. And it was like almost like a triangle, as I remember it, in the snow. And then he was ramming around with them. And then I couldn't tell exactly what was going on. And then if you start heading back up the mountain, he's going through this green growth. And he was literally going through stuff that I'm like, this might be just a huge doe or something. It was like making me doubt it because he was going through stuff. I'm like, he has no antlers. Like none. <laughs> but I'm like, oh, we'll see. So got up and back up into the hardwoods on the south side of the mountain. And it was a big bowl. And they had been feeding all up in there. And I circled probably three times in that bowl. And just to find out where they went out, because he was with the does now, and kept circling, circling. And then I wind up, they find out where they go out, and they go up this ridge. They're going up towards the top of the mountain. And as I just get to that, that crest right there, this partridge is like, <clears throat> and all of a sudden, and all of a sudden, <clears throat> there goes a doe. I'm like, oh, my God, I can't believe it. You know, and this is getting like around noontime. So there's all these blowdowns. And I go, I can't believe that doe ran through all them blowdowns. Like, and they were high blowdowns. So I got up and I stood up on this stump. I'm standing there and I'm looking. I'm like looking down. And all of a sudden I look and I can see this buck coming down. It was just like, and it was just like, it looked like a shadow of him. It was just like, it was like black and white almost. And I see the antlers. And so I take and he's coming down, coming down. And I think he stopped. And I'm like, pow. I'm like trying to see, and he came down, and all of a sudden I saw him come, kind of come down towards me, and I could see him. He's kind of a little loosey goosey there, you know. <laughs> and I'm like, hmm, maybe I hit him. I don't know. <laughs> I wasn't too confident in it at all. <laughs> so I went down, and uh, I could see where he fell, and I could see that I hit him square right in the hind quarter, yeah. right in the joint. So I could see where he fell down. It was like a perfect little red spot. So I'm like, all right, I'm gonna give him half hour anyway so i'm hanging out trying to call my brother i can't get hold of him give it a half hour i walk like 25 yards around this knob this little knoll and he had been bedded right there (laughs) so he gets up and he takes off so i didn't see him but he was right there pretty much the whole time i was there so i give it another half hour so i get on i'm going and i come to this ravine i can see where he's watching his backtrack and he's like just like there's like a thousand hoof prints in this one little spot he's nervous real nervous he knew the kev was behind him yeah and then went down this ravine and come up the side and i'm like i know he's over there i know he's over there and i'm scanning that thing and it wasn't really that thick and i'm looking and looking looking all of a sudden there he goes pow i let one rip at him and i didn't touch him that time so now we're going back over the top of the mountain and now i'm getting i know this area here i know where i am now there's a bunch of shelves that go down so I'm following him, and then now we're back on the north side of the mountain. And probably 40 yards ahead of me, maybe a little more, I can see where he went into this little cl- this clump of fir trees, spruce trees, the young ones. And you can see where the snow was perfectly knocked down. I'm like, all right. And I knew now I know where I am. I've been in this spot before, and I know there's this little swamp right here. So I just started circling around and all of a sudden i'm looking about 25 yards from me it was probably the coolest thing is he's standing there and he's looking back at that clump 
of furs waiting for me to come through that. So I'm watching him watch for me. It was just super cool. And then I just, like a pile, I put it around. How many chest. yards? At that last, he's probably like 25 yards. He wasn't oh, far wow. That's, that is, yeah. that close is yeah. fun. And he was just staring back, like, where I was supposed to be coming from. Like, it was, that was really cool. You beat him yeah. in his game, didn't you? I did. I got lucky there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then I, I wound up. I just hey, stuck. Kev, that wasn't luck. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Hit, hitting the only lucky spot was hitting him with that muzzle. Over. <laughs> yeah, I was. You ain't kidding. You ain't kidding. It was. Yeah. Oh, that's a good story, Kev. Well, it's been great having you on. Yep. Yeah. Reminiscing again. Hadn't seen you for a while, so I know. I yeah. appreciate it. It's good to get together with you guys and meet Joe finally. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully, you'll be knocking around up here a little bit this coming fall. I would like to. Yeah. I would like to. I'm saving all good. vacation time for yeah. it. So excellent. All right. Well, another one in the books. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Talk to you next time. Yeah. Make sure to give him five stars on the rating. <laughs> That's <Yeah>. right. <laughs> give Kevin a five-star rating for his Give story him all. Bit. Go all the way to the scroll down yeah. a little bit. Go all the way to the, yeah. the Get far some right and hit that, yeah. hit that fifth star for these guys. Hey, thanks for tuning in. Till next time, good luck on the trail.